Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Before we dive into the Word, um, just thank you for being a great church. Uh, You may not know this, but uh, this church exists beyond this community. We, We have many campuses that are spread out over three states. And uh, just seeing the work of God in each of our campuses, seeing people transformed by Jesus and working to seeing the community transformed by Jesus. Um, last, the la- over the last eight weeks, I've been in our Colorado campus, our Sherman campus, and our Broken Bow campus, um, spending time in the Word uh, with them, and last week we got to announce in our Colorado campus that after eight years of being uh, portable, we finally closed on land. Uh, for the, we actually have property now in our Woodland Park campus, uh, and so uh, just as we are believing God for. Uh, expanding our facilities and seeing more and more people come to Jesus uh, and being a greater blessing to our city. So we're also believing for a new building. We have property. There's no building on it in Woodland Park. So uh, now we're going to be in another building project, believing God uh, that that he provides and that people are really going to encounter the living God. Um, and uh, see a community transformed by Jesus. Also, Pastor Dwayne, as well as uh, my mom. Sorry, just to be clear, Pastor Dwayne's my dad. Um, (laughs) My dad and mom, uh, as well as my oldest daughter, are in the UK this past week and this weekend. Uh, He's ministering with uh, Brother Andrew uh, at the, the conference there in the UK. So to all of our UK family, hey, Thanks for being a part, and uh, I pray that somehow you can connect to them. We have, uh, we have some great people from the UK that are in our Woodland Park campus, and they, um, they're flying back Tuesday to the UK, uh, and the specific words they said, yes, we're a bit cross that we don't get to see your parents in the UK. <laughs> and I went, okay, that's great. <laughs> Uh, And then, but this week then, uh, my parents will fly to Israel, where my dad will be ministering in five churches uh, over the course of the week. Uh, And so just be in prayer for them, um, because we just, we as a whole church, we just want people to know Jesus. We want to see this world come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And uh, whatever that means for us to live and to whatever work we must commit to, we're all in on it. That's the kind of church we want to be. Um, that's also what I want to talk about today. Um, before we dive into Matthew 11, I just want to pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for who you are and what you've done. Jesus, what you have done for us in your life, death, and resurrection, it's beyond all comprehension. And I pray that we continue to grow in revelation and understanding of seeing you clearer and clearer, knowing you deeper and deeper, that we might, in knowing you, in seeing you, be transformed by you. I pray as we open the scriptures, may you, the living word, be known, be seen, be revealed to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray hearts are touched, minds are touched, and lives are transformed all for the glory of the name of Jesus and the extending of your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And I thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Three pretty familiar verses. Uh, If you're familiar with your Bible at all, you probably are pretty familiar with these verses. But... um, if you're not, uh, these, are, these are very powerful verses. If you are familiar, never assume you're so familiar that you actually fully understand any of your Bible. Um, and the Bible is just a beautiful work of art and God's revelation to us. Uh, we're, we're not going to ever really mind the full depths uh, of our scriptures. But these three verses, I believe, are, are paramount in understanding and in walking in what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus says this, this is the end of chapter 11. He says, come to me, all you who labor 
and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, As Pastor Dwayne taught on the believer's ministry that all of us, all of you, all of us are are commissioned into the ministry to minister one to another, to minister to our community, to minister to the lost and to bring people to Jesus. Um, That can sometimes feel intimidating, be unnerving, um, and uh, maybe even, yeah, you, you, you hear, okay, this is how to do it, but there's still some uh, timidity or intimidation, um, or you're just on the fence. I don't know how I feel about that. And um, we we're in a, a time in our culture where there is a significant clash of worldviews, where the different frames of living are all competing for prominence. And generally speaking, up till 50-ish, 60-ish years ago, generally speaking, a Judeo-Christian framework and worldview was fairly prominent, plenty of exceptions, and plenty of diversity in that. And you, some could argue that it wasn't fully Christian, and I, and I, I hear that argument, But generally speaking, that was just the general culture, the general tide of culture. And that is by far no longer the case. Um, We we do live in a post-Christian culture. Interestingly, there's some parts of our country, namely the coasts, that have been in a post-Christian culture for so long that now it's actually pre-Christian again which means that there's not even any framework for Christianity. All that that community or that culture would know is that that's some fringe uh, group that uh, is no, 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 not prominent or influential. And we, we have to decide how we're going to live, uh, what frame, what worldview we're going to have. All of us have a worldview. And... Uh, it informs the decisions that we make concerning how we live, how we live our day to day. Um, worldviews shape uh, what your belief systems are, and those belief systems will shape how you live, the decisions you make in your actions and words in the course of living. And every worldview is presenting, you maybe could put it in a question form. How are we to live? What's the right way of living? How, how are we to make it in this world? Um, what the ancient writers of scripture would say is, what is the good life? What is the good life that, 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 we, that we, des- we should be desiring and we should be moving our life toward? Who gets to determine the good life? And that's what's being presented in our world today is many competing worldviews as to how to live, what you're to believe, how you're to live, what worldview uh, you should have, and what a good life is. And uh, the Christian, the Judeo-Christian frame of the good life is no longer prominent. And for those who want to push it forward, not the American church hasn't really been killing it on an accurate worldview of Scripture and the good life according to Scripture, yeah. to put it nicely. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if following Jesus is even on your radar, there's many people who are involved in church or even claim to be Christian for all sorts of different reasons. And my desire is that in whatever stage of journey any one of us are in, my hope is that that we be a church that always invite, meets people where they are and invites them to take one step closer to Jesus. That's, that's just as simple as that. Um, and what that means though is that there has to be enough people that take this seriously enough that it's not just a side part of your life. Um, interestingly, that's becoming a lot less, but we still live in the Bible Belt, and so it's still fairly prominent in our, 
our world, where you have a normal life, but then you have your spiritual life on the side. Um, you have, you might even call it your real life, and then you have like the spiritual stuff. Uh, and that, that has a very short shelf life that that's going to be manageable for you. That in the coming, as, as culture progress outside of a significant move of God that we believe is happening, will happen, the trajectory of our culture is that uh, there will be an increased amount of hostility. Now, well, there's going to be an increased amount of hostility no matter what, just so you know. Even if there's a significant turn, uh, there's still going to be increased hostility towards uh, Christianity. It's just the way human history works. It's human nature and the way the kingdom of darkness works, is that as soon as the kingdom of darkness gets a foothold in a culture, it's going to turn up the volume in hostility towards the kingdom of light. And so if you're just going to keep just sort of your religious life, your spiritual life on the side, the increased hostility uh, is going to make you decide. Are you going to integrate this or not? And my, my hope is that all of us are, are moving in the direction of integrating all of our life together under Christ Jesus. It's what it means to consider him Lord, master, and that we, his disciples, that, that what it means to be a Christian should automatically mean that I am a disciple of Jesus. And Jesus makes this pretty clear. He says, come to me, which is a pretty bold statement because his contemporaries um, would talk about coming, to come into the kingdom of God, his contemporaries, would be to take the yoke of Torah, um, which would be the law, to, to take on the yoke of following the law according to however one or rabbi would be interpreting that law. Um, take that yoke. There, would, there was a contemporary uh, about 100 years before Jesus that talked about taking the yoke of wisdom, that wisdom is, is available to us and that we're to take the yoke of wisdom. And there would always be this sense where to come to God, you have to go to wisdom, you have to go to the scriptures, you have to go to the law. And Jesus sort of reinterprets that and says, if you're going to know wisdom, if you're going to know the law, if you're going to live well, you have to come to me. And that's a bold and definitive claim. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Um, just, I think it was about two months, it was within the last two months, the uh, Surgeon General released a report that's been a, a long study in America, that now loneliness is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. We are the most technologically advanced culture in human history. We have the highest amount and value of medicine in the world. We are as informed as maybe all generations combined. We have more information available to us than any previous generation. And mental illness is an epidemic. We spend more on medicine than nearly any other country. We have more available to us, and yet we're the most stressed, anxious, depressed, and lonely. And it's killing us, literally. I mean, like, I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean, it is an epidemic that's killing us to where in, this is the, in the last few years, it's the first time in the last hundred something years where the average lifespan is decreasing, not increasing. It's worldviews that are being presented to us to say, this is how you live. 
And the people who live according to however the world is guiding them are accelerating their own dying. What's being promised as the good life is now being delivered as a more stressful, anxious, depressed, and lonely life. And more and more people are starting to wake up to it. So we say, well, how, how do we fix that? Well, you know, one prominent view is that, well, you change the politics. And I'm all for changing the politics. Um, especially if you don't like it. We have a particular system that I think is very brilliantly designed that you have a part to play in changing the politics. Um, but you have to know that politics is a downstream of culture. If you've lost the culture, you can win a few maybe election cycles, but it won't last because you're not influencing the culture that then uh, politics comes from. And so if, if you and I have a ministry to go be a light in the darkness, then you don't get the, uh, you, you and I don't have permission to offload the responsibility of being a witness onto other people. You can, you can, approach, you can approach this kind of dilemma we're in where a culture is much more uh, driving forward deception and darkness, uh, corruption and evil at just an un, like unimaginable level. Um, you can approach that and just sort of succumb to despair. There's just no hope. There's no way we can change this. The best we can do is to just hide ourselves in a bit of a corner and hope that Jesus comes back in our lifetime. And if not, then I guess we'll just die and be with him. That's one option on the table. I don't recommend it, but it is an option on the table. The other sort of extreme would be to, to take upon yourself a zeal uh, and become a bit of cultural crusader and uh, go obliterate the opposition in all sorts of ways you might be able to do that. Um, and as exciting as that might sound, uh, is that how Jesus did it? Is that how the Apostle Paul? Maybe, okay, so you have Jesus, who is the most influential person in all of human history. But the person that is right next to that is the Apostle Paul who extended the work in the way of Jesus, and that most of what we assume to be the Western world is informed by the thoughts and writings of the Apostle Paul. That's how influential he shaped an entire part of the globe's thinking. How did he do it? Did he go all cultural warrior? No, he, he came to Jesus. And he took Jesus' yoke. And he obeyed Jesus in whatever Jesus instructed him to do. And was as influential as Jesus had guided and directed him to. And he suffered for it. In uh, farming, in Jesus' day, a yoke is uh, it's like a piece of wood that would strap two oxen or two horses together and they would plow or you know, carry a cart or whatever um, together. And, and there's a synergistic effect when two oxen would be able to pull uh, a plow together. But in order to train oxen, what farmers would have to do is they would put a young oxen with a mature and experienced oxen. And that mature, experienced oxen would, would, in a sense, by nature, train the inexperienced. But, but to train meant that the experienced oxen would carry about 90% of the load, 80 to 90% of the load, to where the immature, maybe zealous oxen is only carrying 10, 20% of the load, maybe. 
And so when Jesus says, take my yoke, he doesn't, he doesn't offload the yoke onto something else like the law or wisdom. He says, take my yoke. He invites us into a partnership and relationship, a relationship of proximity. We're connected to him, proximity, but also partnership. That in our zeal or maybe not our zeal, maybe the opposite, our despair, we have to stay yoked to Jesus and at best we'll carry 10, 20% of the load. And this is where we get our Christian life wrong. Is maybe we come to some knowledge, revelation, saving faith in Jesus. Maybe experience some measure of transformation because of that revelation, because of your, your, your initial connection. But in our zeal and excitement or in our anxiety or struggle, we sort of go back to old habits where we have to figure this out on our own. We have to take care of this on our own. From a cultural level, we have to go solve this cultural problem our own self. Or at a personal level, I have to solve my personal problem myself. And Jesus' invitation has remained the same. No, come to me. Come to me, all you that are weighed down with heavy burdens. The heavy burdens of sin. What people don't realize it's like you're just, you're, it's highly unlikely you will ever be able to completely avoid sin. So this might sound like a provocative statement. If you have given your life to Jesus, surrendered your life to Jesus, come to faith in Jesus, receive what he's done for you, sin is not your problem. You are probably your problem. But sin is not your problem. Because, why? Because your sin has been dealt with at the cross. It isn't to say that sin isn't a problem. It's just not your primary problem. There are consequences to sin, but it's certainly not God's judgment on you. Um, Usually the consequences is the judgment. So you're not, you're not going to be able to completely avoid sin. Okay. So if, if, what, what will happen, though, is in staying in connection and partnership with Jesus, sin is a lot less appealing over the course of time. Sin is a lot less appealing. And you, you get retrained that you did have ingrained into your body habits of sin uh, that can be retrained into habits of righteousness. But you can, only, you can only do that when you stay connected to Jesus. So if, if we're... If we have this zeal to go make a difference, that's great. It's fantastic. But it has to be tethered. That zeal has to be tethered because almost always anyone that has zeal untethered to Jesus ends up in burnout. Because the problem is too big. What we are up against is too great to handle it on our own. Or if we give in to the distractions and the negative emotions that that we have, it usually means we've gotten untethered to Jesus and we've given in to all the different inputs that are causing those emotions. Things like anxiety or fear um, or even even take those to more extreme like, like depression Yes, it is possible that that you just sort of go into seasons where that happens to you. But when you're experiencing those feelings, you still have choices to make. You have choices as to where you put your focus, where you put your thoughts, how, how big of a place or authority you give those feelings. And there are certain things that will fuel feelings of anxiety or despair sorrow, grief, or depression. There are certain things that will fuel that and there are certain things that can heal it. And you get to decide where you put your feelings, where you put your thoughts, where you put your focus and what inputs you allow in. And so if, if, if you're experiencing those feelings, almost everyone will experience some form of those kinds of negative emotions over an extended period of time in your lifetime. Don't let anybody lie to you to say they've never had like 
anxiety or, or fear or whatever. Um, what, what will be the difference is what you choose to do. So you get untethered, unyoked to Jesus and you're out on your own. Those feelings will overtake you. And so he says, take my yoke and you will find rest for your souls. See, that's, we have a bit of a soul problem. You might even say we're losing our soul. And Jesus says, you come to me, all that are weighed down with heavy burdens. Sin is a heavy burden. Okay, it's not your primary problem, but people who choose to live in sin, remember, sin, it's pleasurable for a season. But in the end, it reaps death. So before any of us wag a self-righteous finger to a sinful culture, first of all, you were guilty, so just stop. You were once the sinner. Okay? You're not a sinner anymore. You're a saint made righteous and holy by the blood of Jesus. But make no mistake, the people that are engaged in sin, they might become, there, there's, there's, there's an internal war going on in this person that is committed to sin that on the one hand, they want to stay committed to it, but there's something on the inside of them that the Holy Spirit is going to continue to poke at to say, you cannot live this way. And we need to stand for truth that there is right and there is wrong. There is evil and there is good. Truth and goodness have absolutes. But you never stand on the side of truth and goodness self-righteously. Because there will be people that stand on the side of evil, darkness, that will be self-righteous in their evil. And so some people will completely give in to the kind of arrogance and pride that hardens the heart from sin. But sin is a heavy burden. And there's many who are just at war. And they feel weighed down by the weight of their sin. And so the one thing that will completely destroy them would be a self-righteous Christian who looks condescendingly at their sin. How does Jesus look at the person weighed down with their sin? Come to me, all you that are heavy laden. There's some that are weighed down with heavy burdens from legalism. It's not as prominent anymore. You know, the more post-Christian the culture has gotten, the more legalism has not looked that appealing. Fantastic. But it is still possible that you labored some of your adult life under a kind of legalism, that God is just mad at you. He's never going to be pleased with you. Like the, the, the one thing he wants to do is just burn you. And if you, don't, if you don't stay straight, if you don't do what's right, if you don't continue to obey, then God's just going to send you to hell. And like, that's just horrible. Not only that, it's stupid. I don't mean to be coarse about it, but like, you just, you cannot, you cannot, I don't know how you get that picture from your Bible. But to those who are weighed down with the heavy burden of legalism, he says, come to me. There's a reason why we come to Jesus. Because he showed us exactly what it's like to both live well in God's world, but also live under God's rule without being a legalist. And so only he can relieve the burden of legalism. But there's a burden that many will live under. I'll put it under the general category of materialism. The, I think it was Rockefeller that was asked. So this is talking, we're, if it's not him, it's like someone of that kind of wealth, okay? Like 80, 90 years ago, something like that. When, when sort of more and more wealth in our society was starting to get influxed. And uh, someone asked him, how much, how much money is enough? Like, how much is enough? And his answer is exactly how so much of our culture is shaped. 
His answer was, just a little bit more. If I just get that next raise, I'll have, I get that next job, that increased income. I'm not saying any of that's bad. Um, and the, the church, eventually, I'm going to have the courage to do a whole message or series on this. That the, the church should be able to have the capacity to handle great amounts of wealth. Because the, the hope would be that those maturing Christ bear the maturity to have great wealth without it possessing them. And that's a heavy burden. The never enough, next paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, next purchase to next purchase. This, if I just get this next thing, it will make me happy. And to all those heavy laden, Jesus says, come to me. We're not, and, and, then, and then he, so he says, come to me. And then he says, take my yoke. Get tethered in intimate relationship with me, which, which if you're yoked to Jesus, that's the picture you're getting, a, a, a piece of wood that you're kind of locked in. Like you ain't going anywhere. You're locked in to Jesus, okay? That, that would mean that you can't, you, the, the picture there is that you would be unable very long to live an unintegrated life where you could separate your real life from your spiritual life. Because you would have to bring your whole life in connection to Jesus. That's what, that's what he, Jesus doesn't just care about your afterlife. He cares about your whole life and he has something to say about your whole life. And the idea is that, you see, Jesus, as his disciple, he lives in the reality of the kingdom of God. That's a different reality. And this is where our worldview is to be shaped by the reality of the kingdom of God made manifest in King Jesus. That's the, that's the worldview that we're to live in and from. And it's going to clash with other worldviews. And so as his disciple, we have to learn what is it like to live with that worldview? What worldview do I have wrong that needs to be changed? I need to repent of and align my life to the kingdom of God. What assumptions do I have about life or myself or identity that are, are wrong or maybe not just wrong, but even evil that I need to bring to Jesus for him to adjust my thinking, adjust my assumptions, adjust my belief, and be in line with his kingdom, with the reign and rule of God. He says, take my yoke. Learn from me. Jesus has something to say about every part of your life. As a matter of, <laughs> just on the subject of money, Jesus has more to say about money and how you live with money than he does about your afterlife. So I'm just saying, he has something to say about every part of your life, and you have to learn. He says, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, meek and humble. There's a few different synonyms you can use there. And this is where you'll have to know that there will be competing worldviews, because he says, the way to have rest for your souls... For that anxious, zealous, fearful, depressed, despairing soul, the way that that gets rested is by learning from Jesus, being in proximity and partnership relationship with him. Learning from him, he is meek and gentle. That's meek and lowly in heart or meek and humble. And he says, this is how you have rest for your souls, to be meek and humble. And competing worldviews that many of us have would say, Jesus, that's, that's well and great for you, but the rest of us live in the real world. That's, that's great for the spiritual person, but the rest of us that have to live in this world, being meek and humble, you'll get mowed over, you'll get destroyed, you'll get looked over. And yet Jesus is convinced that to live well in this world would be to be meek, unassuming, and humble, willing to go to the bottom and serve. And this is where we're like, okay, I thought I wanted to be yoked up to Jesus until it was going to cost me something. 
where he says, don't be anxious about your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or what you shall wear. The Gentiles worry about those things. I'd say food, shelter, clothing. Those are kind of basic and essential needs. And Jesus says, don't worry. Don't be anxious about that. Seek first the kingdom. All these things will be added to you. He says, be meek. Don't shove yourself forward. Don't make assumptions about people. Be meek. Be humble. Be willing to serve. Yeah, but I'll be overlooked. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you want rest for your souls or not? Okay, because I still because if we're if if you're gonna bear ministry well in this world, it's not going to be because Jesus sent you out and is now leaving you alone. You're on your own now, go for it. And you're gonna have to figure out how how when it starts competing with the other worldviews, how you're going to live. And the only, uh, the only way you and I are called to live is live as Jesus' disciple, which includes, not limited to, but includes being meek and humble. Yeah. Yeah. You want rest for your souls? You want to be able to be a minister and yet an unanxious, undespairing soul. Right. Well, it's going to require you to be yoked to Jesus. Right. And to take seriously, he says, come to me, take my yoke, and learn from me. That's being his disciple in whatever you're, de- whatever you're dealing with, whatever you have going on in your life, whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever challenge you're faced with, you have to learn from him and be yoked to him if you can approach that with a rested soul, an unanxious, undepressed, joy-filled, peaceful soul. And if enough people live that kind, because this way says that's the good life. You want the good life? You're going to have to be yoked to Jesus. You're going to have to learn from him. And you having a peaceful soul will act as a witness to the people who are consumed by that kind of anxiety and despair or hate and anger. Dallas Willard would say, that the ultimate test of discipleship is if one will spontaneously love their enemies. Ouch, none of us are disciples. (laughs) We all just got disqualified, right? What it does say is that we're all on a really long journey. Because that's part of following Jesus. Jesus loved his enemies. And as you go out into the world to minister, as you go minister to people that you care about and you want to see saved, you want to see reached for Jesus and they hate you, it goes from just being a little awkward to like mocking. How are we going to handle that? Already, just sort of at a national level, the general culture hates us. But it's, it's not that putrid in all of our personal relationships. It's possible that a few people in your life just absolutely despise you for being a follower of Jesus. That is very possible. It's just probably not the general category. It's probably just not the general environment and, and culture we live in in our day-to-day life. So, that, but that, 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 it will not stay that way. It will, it will get more hostile. And we, and we will have to decide, are we going to continue to move forward in being a witness and being a witness of Jesus? And then if we're going to be a witness of Jesus, how will we do that? Will, be a, will, will we be a self-righteous zealot? Say, fine, go to hell. You want to reject the cross? You can go to hell. Okay, you, you saw what I did there. Or are we going to stay faithful to Jesus? And not just faithful to Jesus by what we claim, truth that we claim, but faithful to Jesus in the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus that is meekness and humility. You can't, you will, we will not be able to do that if we're not yoked to him. And here's the deal. Here's really, here's really the, 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 the truth. Guys, we don't have it that bad. 
I'm sorry. It, it's, it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. And then occasionally, a few of us will get some hostility. From a national level, just kind of a, a, a national culture, yeah, it's, it's pretty hostile. I was just recently in Portland. Yeah, it's pretty hostile. <laughs> um, but uh, last month, a New York Post article released that a family in North Korea, including the toddler, was sentenced to life in prison because the family was found with a Bible. Our brothers and sisters in China, along with other subgroups, are being targeted for organ harvesting. Like they, they don't, they, if you're a Christian and you go to the hospital, you possibly will be put under and some of your organs stolen by the government. In Iran, one of the fastest growing Christian movements on the planet is in one of the most hostile environments in Iran which a lot of the leadership is women and a lot of the evangelism is focused on discipleship and it's one of the fastest growing. And if your family finds out that you are Christians, you can, you can, you can go to YouTube, Sheep Among Wolves. There's a couple different like documentary films on YouTube about the Iranian church and the stories of having to secretly go into this house and everybody removes any kind of cellular device and they take all the batteries out of the cellular devices, put them in a tub and cover it with blankets and then they go to a soundproof room where they quietly worship Jesus and quietly talk through the word of God. Because they could be, they could be, by any radical Muslim, can come in and rape all of them, kill all of them and there'll be zero accountability for that. And if you listen to the way they speak, they say, and all I want to do is the people who are going to hell to reach them for Jesus. They're they're having discussions. Husbands and wives are having to have discussions to say, if we get brought in and if you're being raped, what do you want me to do? All for the name of Jesus. Jesus. In 2015, there were 20, 20 Coptic Christians. It was 21. The one has an interesting story. On a beach in Libya, released as a video, that these terrorists said that basically Jesus is making them swine and we will fill the ocean with their blood. They beheaded him. 20 Coptic Christians. One who was caught with these, these were Egyptian construction workers in Libya, and they were were kidnapped by this terrorist group. And they gave him an option, renounce Christ or be beheaded. And listen, here's, here's the deal. If you go just straight up doctrine, we don't believe what Coptic Christians believe. Okay? just strictly doctrinal lines. None of them renounced. The 21st person, who was not a Coptic Christian, doesn't really know what his background was, but he wasn't, he wasn't with them. He was from Ghana, a different country. He was an immigrant. And he was working with these construction workers. And he just said, their God's my God. And they were all beheaded. I think we can stomach some awkward. I have no idea. If, if, if things go unchanged on the trajectory of our country, it's probably, it would probably take longer than my lifetime at the rate it's going. It's going pretty fast, but I, I, doubt, I doubt it would go to total murder and killing of Christians in our country within my lifetime, things go unchanged. But definitely in my kids' lifetime. 
So on the one hand, we're raising our children and committing our lives to seeing people transformed by Jesus and believe that changing an entire culture, that's not on us. That's on Jesus. Being a witness is on us. And that's how Jesus in little pockets like this starts transforming a larger culture. And we have brothers and sisters all over this country who are committed to the same thing. Okay? So yes, we, are, we, we must live an integrated life yoked up to Jesus with a restful soul so that we can be a faithful witness. And then when faced with suffering, suck it up. Okay? Because if we don't go into that, it will get worse for our kids. So on the one hand, we're, we're, we're learning to be witnesses. On the other hand, we're raising our children to both be witnesses, but also with the possibility that them being a witness could be at the cost of their life. And I'm raising my children with that understanding. And I'm not anxious about it. Because I'm yoked up to Jesus. When I start feeling afraid, I have to remember who I'm yoked to. I'm not yoked to some anything else. Let me just conclude with this in 1 Peter chapter 4. Go to 1 Peter 4 and I'll end here. And I'm not one of those preachers that gives like five endings, okay? (laughs) I might go long, but I I don't lie to you. This is my finally, <laughs> my final finally. First Peter chapter four, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Yes, things are pretty, things are pretty corrupted and evil in our culture, okay? But... Having to change where you shop because the stores that you shop at, it's like they've always been corrupted. It's just now it's being surfaced. Okay. So, no, yeah, you're going to have to change. You might need to change where you shop and who you support. That is not a fiery trial, guys. Look at this, verse 13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. This is talking about our Iranian brothers and sisters, our Chinese brothers and sisters, our Egyptian brothers and sisters. Yes, some of us, some of you, will have some kinds of sufferings that is hostility from neighbors and friends and family. Yeah, it includes that. But let's not assume that what we're going through is as bad as it gets. You share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. I think next week I want to talk about perspective. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. So you're not going to feel that way when you get insulted. Their first reaction upon being insulted is not going to be, whoa, I am blessed. That's why you have to make the choices now. When you're not feeling the hostility, how am I going to live? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let no one of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Like, don't bring it on yourself, okay? Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. This is a heavy verse. Okay, verse 17. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And, and then he quotes an Old Testament scripture, if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Verse 19, therefore let us, let those who suffer according to God's will, 
entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. There's a, probably a whole lot of what that means and certainly no time to, to dig into all that that would mean. But any sense of suffering, any sense of it, even the mild form of what's happening at a national level for us, is all a chance for us to purify our heart. Are we serious about this? Are we serious about following Jesus? Are we serious about our worldview? Or are we just still on the fence? Kind of Christian, kind of not. That's what it means for judgment to begin at the house of God. God cannot judge the world if he doesn't, if his bride isn't ready. And so as much as you want to call judgment down on the world and all the people who are evil and corrupted, we have to be willing to stand. And here's the good news. You stand in the righteousness of God. Okay? So that's, that's cool. You're good there. You're standing in the righteousness of God. But do we have some self-righteousness that needs to be purged and cut off because it's negatively affecting the witness we bring to Jesus? I'm not so sure there's that many people who've rejected Jesus. There's a ton of people that's rejected a self-righteous church. So, I would say that if Peter says that was the time for the church to be purified, it's probably still in effect today. And I would say you and I can endure. We can endure faithfully in the last, that last verse. Keep at it. Keep walking in God's will. Keep pursuing God's will. And in pursuing his will, if it brings suffering, you can trust God. While doing good. Keep doing the right thing. Come to Jesus. Take his yoke. Learn from him. And suffer with him. And if it gets awkward, trust me, it could be worse. And we're going to see brothers and sisters in heaven that, are, that bear the scars of their martyrdom. And we're probably going to be embarrassed by how weak we've been. I don't know if you came in expecting that today, but <laughs> we're going to be serious about being Jesus' disciple. And I truly believe, I have no idea about our nation. I trust God with our nation, but I, I want to trust God with this community. I truly do believe within not just our lifetime, within soon, we can see this whole local culture transformed by Jesus. It's going to take a church being willing to suffer, to be awkward, to have the ministry upon you and the power of the Holy Spirit upon you, and you just keep at it and suffer hatred and ridicule and mockery, and, and you keep doing good. And you keep loving those who mock you and forgiving them. It's not easy being Jesus' disciple when, when things like that happen. Amen.